I'll be reading 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 18 to 22, out of the New American Standard. 1 Corinthians 11, 18 to 22. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this, I will not praise you. Good morning, Mesa Church. Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Amen. And let the church say amen one more time. Amen. amen. What a joy it is for me to be up here to present to you God's message this morning. And welcome to our family worship. Amen. So this morning, uh, there's something very special that has been prepared for uh, the Lord's Supper. And I will give you a little bit more information on that when the time arises. We're doing things a little bit different this morning because of the nature of the message. We've decided to put the Lord's Supper on the tail end of the message instead of the beginning. And you'll you'll see why in in just a moment. But this morning I want to invite you to the subject, Making Mealtime Meaningful, with a subtopic, Creating a Commendable Communion. All right? So I don't know about you, But when I was younger, I would, uh, I would often go to morning worship and I wouldn't pay much attention because I was thinking about what was going to happen after worship was over. And I lived next door to my grandmother and my grandmother, Mary Wade, is a, was a phenomenal cook. Her meals were so good that the sermon meant nothing to me on Sundays. I was in full expectation and anticipation of the meal that was going to follow the Sunday morning worship. And I can remember now just, just casually thinking about Sunday morning or, or Sunday uh, lunch Sunday dinner, I can remember the, the, the smell of the ham, the smell of the baked chicken, the smell of the cabbage, collard greens, yams, mac and cheese, pound cake, homemade ice cream, fried tomatoes, black eyed peas. See, you're not even listening to me right now. You're just thinking about what you're going to eat after worship. But this was something that my grandmother did every, I don't know, maybe two or three Sundays out of the month. We knew that we were going to have family dinner after Sunday morning worship. And it was very uh, uh, pleasant when you would walk into our home, you could smell all these foods just, just um, in the air. And, and it was exciting. And it brought us together as a family. And when we came together as a family on Sunday dinner, there, there was storytelling where we learned about our family and our history as a, as a family. There was a lot of laughter. There was a lot of fun. There was a lot of uh, a drama, too, sometimes. But even in that drama, it was the food that brought us together to give us the opportunity to have reconciliation. Family dinner was a time for us to reconnect with one another. It was also a time for, for comfort. You felt like you belonged. You felt accepted. You have a a renewed sense of of identity. How many of you remember Sunday dinner when you were growing up? Amen. Unfortunately, Sunday dinner, family dinner has 
become a thing of the past. Here are some current trends regarding family dinner. Sharing a family meal with undivided attention has been declining since 1966. Almost 50% of parents say they eat fewer meals with their family now than they did when they were growing up. 50%. It is now customary for families to eat in isolation in modern culture. A lot of times when families come together to eat, they're not together at all. Some are eating in their bedroom. Some are eating in front of the computer, in front of the TV, on their phone. Uh, people are now eating in their cars. They're, we're just fragmented. Another study said that college students are no longer eating in cafeterias. Cafeterias are now becoming a thing of the past. That college students are preferring to eat in isolation in their dorms or on the go, or on their way to class, or on their way to work. And a 2014 study revealed that about 50% of Americans regularly eat alone. So what's the main idea? Eating meals as a family is on a consistent, on a constant decline. And there's a lot of research I'm going to give to you in just a moment that testifies of the need for families to come together again for family dinner, for family meals. So why are families isolated? What's isolating these families now? Well, something as simple as me time. I just want time to myself. I need time to decompress. And because our lives are so busy, our schedules are so hectic, we decide to eat alone just so we can have a sense of just, oh, I just want to let my hair down. I just, well, I don't have any hair. Uh, I just want to relax. I just don't want to be bothered by people. Multitasking. Our schedules have become so busy. We work so much that we can't even sit down to have a decent meal together. And so when we eat, we're doing all kind of different things at the same time. Our culture has now evolved into a culture of snacking or eating three-course meals. Four-course meals are things of, a thing of the past. We just get something to hold us over until we become hungry again. So we're getting snack food after snack food after snack food instead of coming together and set, setting aside time to have a meal together. Also, it's just a matter of convenience. It's hard to get everyone scheduled together to have family dinner. And so it's just more convenient to just, you know, you eat your meal, you worry about, you know, you know your meal, and I'll do my thing, and it'll be fine. And of course, technology takes us away from family meals. Even families who eat together, most of them are eating in front of some type of screen. Usually it's the phone or the TV. Uh, Single-parent homes, when you have one parent in the home who has to work to make ends meet, often working uh, two or three jobs just to survive, they don't have the opportunity to have family meal time. Dual-income families, when you have a husband and wife who are both out in the workforce, it's really hard to make the schedules come together to have meal time. I get it. And then there's family conflict. And conflict just leads to fragmentation where the family just separates because there's so much conflict they couldn't even think about coming together as a family to have a family meal. That would be disastrous. Talk a little bit more about that in just a bit. But I want you to know this morning that God has given food a purpose. And I think in, this cost, in our culture today, we have totally... Um, we do not understand the reason for food. And because we don't understand the reason, because we don't look at other cultures and, and how they, they value food, how they view food, that we're missing out. And so I want to give you some biblical feast. I want to give you some ideas that I found in Scripture that relates to God, to food, to family, to community. So there's this feast called the Feast of the Passover. I know many of you are familiar with that. 
It remembers the last plague in Egypt, Egypt when the Egypt, um, Israelites were under Egyptian captivity. And God sent out these plagues. And on the last plague, it was uh, the plague that was going to take the life of, of the, un, uh, the firstborn child. And so Moses directed the children of Israel to put blood on the doorposts. And the death angel would pass through. And if the death angel saw blood on the doorpost, they'll pass over that particular home and allow that child to survive. And any doorpost that did not have the lamb's blood over it, that child would die. And so there was a feast that God had commanded the children of Israel to continue to remember this Passover. Called the Passover feast. And then there's another feast that God instituted for the children of Israel, and that is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And now this is a seven-day feast that begins on the day following the start of the Passover. And when the children of Israel had to, to exit Egypt, they had to leave in a hurry. And so bread was a staple food at that time, but because they had to leave in such a quick fashion, they didn't have time to put the yeast in the bread for the bread to, to leaven, to plump up. So they had to hurry up and make the bread to get out of Egypt so they could have something on their travel. And so God said, all right, I need you to have a feast of unleavened bread so that you can remember your exit out of Egypt where God had freed you from Egyptian captivity. There's another feast called the Feast of uh, First Fruits. So the Feast of First Fruits is one of three Jewish harvest feasts to thank and honor God for his provisions. And so they would give the priests the first of their harvest to show God how grateful they were for his daily provisions. Then there's the Feast of Weeks. The Feast of Weeks, or some call it the Feast of Pentecost, is a feast that happened 50 days following the Passover feast. Then there is the, the Feast of Trumpets. Feast of Trumpets is a, a beautiful declaration of God's commands uh, towards his people to rest. How many of you get tired after you eat a good meal? Yeah, that's the, that's the, 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 feast, of, uh, the feast of Trumpets. Um, and so during all the work uh, that the Israel, Israelites were, were doing, God said, all right, you need to rest. And on this day of rest, during this Feast of Trumpets, you need to eat. Eat and rest. Then there's the Lord's Supper. We go over into the New Testament, and we know what that symbolizes. It's a fellowship between Jesus and his church, meant to remember the life, the death, the resurrection of Christ, and a proclamation of his second coming. And, and that's just a really small summary of the Lord's Supper. It's much more than that. And then we have the great marriage feast that's going to happen when Jesus comes back, where, where the, the, the sinners who are now the saved will be feasting with their, their Savior. And so mealtime was, was extremely important in the heart of God. He, he gave food a purpose. He gave meals a meaning. And there's so many more feasts in the scriptures that we haven't even touched on. As we think about this unleavened bread that we're going to take a, partake of in just a little bit. So Gabby, Janelle, and Diamond and I had this great idea of making unleavened bread for all of you. How wonderful is that? <laughs> wonderful for you. We had a lot of fun. So your treat for, for today is you have fresh made unleavened bread that is, you are going to partake of during the Lord's Supper. You are welcome. And we also have gluten-free. Thank you, Gabby. I forgot. So we have gluten and gluten-free. The gluten is organic gluten. <laughs> uh, the gluten-free is gluten-free. And it's going to be in the back, uh, in the prep room back there. And it's not been cross-contaminated. So there's some relief for you. All right. So we know that God has a purpose for food. And we can understand this because we have a purpose for food, too, in America, right? I know God has instituted all these feasts for the children of Israel, and we see the significance of food in the Bible. But we can relate because we like to eat. Amen. 
We're one of the most unhealthiest societies in the world, the most obese. <laughs> so we like to eat, I understand, but, but we can relate. We know the importance of meals and celebrations, just like the children of Israel, right? Independence Day, what do we do? We eat. Memorial Day, what, what, what do we do? We eat again. When there's birthdays, what do we do? We go out and do what? Eat. When there's anniversaries, we, we do what? We eat. Thanksgiving, what do we do? We eat. What about Christmas? We eat. What about Labor Day? We eat. What about Mother's Day? Father's Day? All right. You guys are ha get, getting the hang of it. After weddings, what do we do? After funerals, what do we do? <laughs> we love to eat. So we understand the significance of, of, of food in relation to celebrations, memorials. Uh, some of us even use food as a, as a source of comfort, right? So what is God's purpose for food? 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 3 helps us to understand that God has given us food for our enjoyment. That's why we have taste buds. He wants us to taste the salt and the sugar. Amen. God created food for our enjoyment. See, that, that's why I, I, I can't think about the idea of joining a denomination, because some of these denominations have way too many food, food restrictions, right? Islam, you can't eat pork. I love bacon. I love pork chops. I love pig's feet. I love chitlins. Some of you don't know what that is. Talk to me after service. I'll give you a chitlins 101. I love pork, so um, Islam won't work for me. Judaism, you can't eat pork there either. Or shellfish. I love crab and lobster. That wouldn't work for me. Let's see, Hinduism and Buddhism. Restrictions on meat again. I love steak. I love prime rib. But the great thing about Christianity is we can eat. I think there's only one food restriction, and that is, number one, don't indulge, overindulge, right? So there should be some moderation, and I think there's something about not eating blood. But outside of that, we can have whatever we want. That's not the only reason you should be a Christian, just saying. It's just something I can appreciate. That God has given us food for our enjoyment. So 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 says, There are certain teachers who are false teachers who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be, to be received with what? Thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. I can't be a Mormon. I drink coffee every single day. Wouldn't make it. All right, number two. What's another purpose for food? Reminder of our continued dependence on God. This was interesting. So in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, it says this. And he, being God, humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So here God is letting the children of Israel know there's a reason that you have hunger pains. It's not because I want to torture you. It's to let you know that your dependence in this world is really on me. God has given our hunger pains a purpose. And it's for us to realize that God is our sustainer of life. I was having an inter interesting conversation with my wife, and I had this epiphany. The idea is that, you know, man cannot create food. Man cannot create food. We can reproduce it. We can multiply it. But we can't create it. God has created the information, the seed in order for food to exist. So every time we eat, it's, 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 a, it's an object lesson, a testimony of how God provides for us. And we so often forget about that. God has a purpose for food in the sense that 
we can see food in Scripture was used for making covenants and for, for peace and fidelity. So in Genesis chapter 26, verses 26 through 30, there's the story of Isaac, and he's in this, in this land, and he needs whales to be, to be dug out so that him and his livestock and his servants could have something to drink. And there was this, um, this king named Abimelech where Isaac was, was digging these wells, and every time he dug a well, Abimelech would come and fill the well with dirt. And so Isaac had to move, and then he tried to dig more wells, and there were more people coming to destroy and disrupt this process. And eventually, Abimelech came to Isaac and said, you know what, I see that, that God is with you. I see that God is with you now. Let us make peace. Let us reconcile. Let us make a covenant with one another. And guess what they used to make a covenant with one another? Take a wild guess. <laughs> Maybe it was lettuce. I don't know. But it, but it was food. It was food. And then in Joshua chapter 9, verse 14, there's another story of, of Joshua, Joshua and the uh, Gibeonites, and they deceive Joshua. So they hear of Joshua conquering all these lands and defeating all these armies, and so they're afraid. And so what they try to do is they, they get worn sandals, they get dried out moldy bread, they get wineskins that are completely depleted, and they live right next door to the children of Israel. And so they made it seem as if they traveled such a far away to make peace with Joshua so Joshua doesn't conquer and destroy them. And so what Joshua and the children of Israel, uh, unfortunately, they don't consult God in this peace treaty. And they say, okay, we see that you've traveled very far. We see that you are destitute. You have no food. Your wineskins are empty. Your clothes are deteriorating. Okay, we'll make peace with you. All the while, they lived right next door. And guess how they uh, solidified their peace contract? Guess what they used? I can't hear you. Food! Again, yes. Then when we look at Matthew chapter 26, uh, in, in verse 28, we talk about the communion, the Lord's Supper. Even Jesus says, referring to his blood, my blood is the blood of the new what? The new covenant. A peace treaty. Establishing a covenant between God and man. God has also used food for intimacy and closeness. This is also very interesting as I was going through scriptures. In Luke chapter 24, verse 41, so Jesus has already uh, been betrayed, he's already died, and he's been resurrected. And so there's a couple of his disciples walking along the road, and he sees them walking, and he joins them. And he's walking and talking with them and asking, you know, why are you so sad? What's wrong? And they say, haven't you heard what has happened? Jesus is, is dead. Everyone in the town is talking about it. How could you not know what is going on here? And they don't realize that they're, they're walking with, with Jesus. And so they're walking and talking and walking and talking, and eventually they get to a place and Jesus comes in with them. They still don't know it's Jesus. And then Jesus sits down and he takes the food and he breaks it and blesses it. And that's when they realized it was Jesus the Christ. That he was with them the entire time. And it took him blessing and breaking and distributing the food for them to truly realize who was in their midst the entire time. So there's something about the culture of Christ in which he lived that food meant something much more than pleasure, satisfaction, indulgence, and nutrition. There was some, something intimate about eating together. Going back to uh, making covenants, there was a a member here uh, that I had a little conflict with, and we were trying to figure out, you know, how, how are we going to get this resolved? Um, I love you. I know, I know that you love me. We have a really good relationship. Uh, we need, really need to work this thing out. 
because we're brothers in Christ and and our wives got together because we couldn't do it the way that it should have been done and we decided okay well let's let's go meet somewhere and we met somewhere uh, in, in Mesa called Buffalo Wild Wings and went to Buffalo Wild Wings and we had a tremendous meal and, and at Buffalo Wild Wings we reconnected we reconfirmed our love and and our and our devotion to one another as brothers in Christ uh, and, and so it was the meal that brought us together again so if there's conflict with you and anyone else in this church you know chicken is a great reconciliation food I guarantee it it works and it really allowed us the opportunity to have a deep um, authentic intimate conversation of vulnerability with one another Food is awesome. Thank you, Jesus. All right. God has a purpose for food in the sense that it is proof of Jesus' resurrected body. So again, in Luke um, 24, verse 41, so the, the disciples were, were in, in a room, in a home, and they were eating, they were fellowshipping, and Jesus had died, and He's been resurrected since then, and he appears to them, and they're doubting. They don't believe Jesus was risen from the dead. They don't know what to believe now until Jesus eats a piece of fish. He eats a piece of fish to prove to them that, look, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. This is me. This is, this is Jesus in the flesh. I'm in my resurrected body, but I, guess what? I still, have, I still have organs as you do. Let me prove it. I still have a tongue. I still have an esophagus. I still have a stomach. I can still eat physical food. It was proof that Jesus was raised from the dead with a body. Amen, church. God has a purpose for food in the sense that God, I believe, has used or is using food to create in us a hospitable heart. There are many, many scriptures that I could reference that talk about the hospitality, hospitality that God wants us to have towards one another. And not just church members. You go all the way back to the book of Deuteronomy, even foreigners, strangers, people who are not like us, who look like us, people who are passing through our land. And this, this same idea transfers over into, into the New Testament in Romans chapter 12 and 13. 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 8 and 9, it talks about practicing hospitality. Don't neglect to be hospitable to one another. How do we do that? What does that look like? It looks like being very vulnerable. It looks like not living a life of comfort and security and safety. It looks like maybe putting yourself at risk, but bringing people into your home and serving them. And sometimes we forget about this, this duty, this obligation, this discipline that God expects us to be hospitable. In Genesis 19 verse 2, you know the story of Lot? When the angels came to his home, what did he do? He fed them, right? What about Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10, verse 40? It says that Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Because when a guest came to your home, they were Lord. They were honored. They were respected. They were given the, the, the preeminence. And I think we need to get back to that because God tells us don't neglect hospitality. So give your food, give your meal times meaning because God has a purpose for food. As we continue, there are some wonderful benefits, wonderful benefits of having meal time with your family. So let me just give you several. So frequent family meals has been known to enhance language development in children and emotional stability. Eating family, eating meals as a family has been shown to play a role in healthy eating habits in the future uh, and also the role of prevention 
of high-risk behaviors among teenagers. So they looked at teens uh, who ate with their family and teens who didn't eat with their family regularly, and there was an increased amount of risky behaviors such as, you know, promiscuity, drug, substance use and abuse, alcohol use and abuse, but there's a magic number. So the research revealed that in order to have a lot of these benefits of eating um, family meal together, you had to do it five to seven times a week. So at least one meal uh, or throughout the day, five to seven times a week, and the meal should last at minimum 10 minutes. 10 minutes of, of quality, engaging conversation, and you'll reap these benefits. So young children who enjoy regular family meals have greater vocabularies and reading skills. Children who excelled in school and on achievement tests more commonly came from homes that participated in family meals. And this even assessed for single-parent homes, too. So even single parents can get the same benefits that um, dual-parent households have if you choose to eat meals together five to seven times a week. There's also research that shows increased cognitive development, increased emotional well-being, and just family closeness in general. Uh, family meals produce smells. I'm sure there are smells that if you smell will bring up memories of your past, right? Certain food smells bring up uh, memories, so it actually helps in the processing of long-term memories. Family meals produce a greater sense of belonging and acceptance, higher self-esteem, and increased parent and child communication. Family meals decrease stress and tension in the home. Uh, so so there's, there's loads of, of, of benefits if we just sit back, take time out, schedule meal time with our family five to seven times a week. And these don't have to be anything extravagant. It can just be eating together for breakfast, for lunch, even a snack. But it's coming together as a family and decreasing the fragmentation. Now, I, I, I get it that sometimes things don't work well when we come together as a family. I understand that sometimes mealtime is, is difficult. Sometimes it's draining depending on what your family dynamic is. Sometimes it feels like torture, maybe. Sometimes it's more stressful to come together as a family. I get it, because my home is like that sometimes, especially when you have younger children. Uh, maybe you find yourself saying things at the family meal, like, you know, get your elbows off the table, right? Stop hitting your sister. Put your phone down. Turn off the TV. Eat all your vegetables. Quit eating your sister. <laughs> In my home, there's a lot of yelling that goes along when we're eating our meals together. Mostly at Gavin. <laughs> but guess what? The Corinthian church had these same problems. So I wanted to take just a brief look at what the Corinthian church was experiencing when it came to the Lord's Supper. And I want to make just a few mealtime applications from these um, passages, and then we will continue with our communion and our worship. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, Paul says, But in the following instructions I do not commend you, because when you come together it is not for the better, but for the worse. It is not for the better, but for the worse. So there's some other research out there that has revealed that when families come together for meals, but when they come together infrequently, when it's less than three times per week, things aren't well. The family does not benefit from family meal time when it's infrequent. So the least frequent the family meals, the more distractions occur when family meals take place because you're not used to coming together. And so sometimes it is aggravating. Sometimes you do become upset, short-tempered, stressed out. There's one kid that I counsel, and he said every time his family comes together, there's anxiety. 
And he says, we're not even doing anything that's anxiety provoking. It's just the idea of coming together with my family brings, it, brings me anxiety. Infrequent family meals were linked to higher rates of drug and alcohol use among teens, depressive symptoms, suicide attempts, antisocial behavior, low academic performance, delinquency, antisocial behavior. There was one family that I counseled years ago when I was a young therapist, and I knew that there was something about family meals that they were missing out on. And so I encouraged them to have a, a meal together. And this was a family that was in a lot of conflict, very volatile. They had a meal together and they came back to the therapy session and said, that was a horrible idea. It didn't work out. We argued, we fought. Uh, people's, um, people were, were hurt, you know, emotionally, psychologically. And I, found, I figured out there was something that was missing. It wasn't just having the meal together. There was something that was missing before they came together to have the meal. I had to change or encourage them to, to change the atmosphere or the tone of the family before they came together for the meal. And so when we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, they came together as brothers and sisters in Christ, but it wasn't for their benefit. In other words, Paul was saying, it's better if you didn't meet for communion, for the Lord's Supper, because people are leaving here worse than when they came. And then verse 18 through 22, he says, for in the first place, when you come together as a, as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk, what? Do you not have houses to eat and to drink? Then he says, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Should I commend you on this? No, I will not. So the Corinthian church struggled with some things I think we all struggle with in our, in our homes. When they came together, they came together with an attitude of self-centeredness, an attitude of sinful indulgence. They were ignoring one another's basic needs just for survival. Paul says, you, are, you despise one another. That's a really strong word for him to use. In other words, he says, you're so arrogant. You're so egotistical. You're so contemptuous. You, you belittle, you humiliate, you embarrass, you, you, you think little of the people around you. And sometimes we have these ideas about our family. And so it makes our coming together much worse and not better. Paul says you humiliate, you criticize one another. In the Greek translation of the word humiliation, it means to curse vehemently. I mean, these were some, some tough cookies. A lot of emotional and psychological and verbal abuse coming from the church, but sadly it comes from our home too. He says you frustrate one another, you dishonor one another. There's a lack of cons consideration and compassion for those who are in need. And sometimes our, our families, as we come together for mealtime, because there's a lack of compassion, because we're not aware of, of our family members' needs, that when we come together, it's not helpful because the tone hasn't been set. The environment has not been set the way that it should be. Paul says there's a lack of consideration and compassion. And he says, you're not doing what Lord has intended for you to do. And then there's the consequence from all this. The consequences of the Corinthian church, I believe, could also be the consequences for our family if we have this type of environment before we come together at mealtime. What was the consequence? In verse uh, 30, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, he says, that's why many of you are, are weak. That's why many of you are ill. And that's why many of you die. And some may think that this is a spiritual death, de death or, or maybe it's a physical death. I think it's both. There were people who were starving. 
There were people who were in poverty. There were people who had nothing. And there were people who had everything. And they neglected the needs of their brothers and sisters. And so the consequence was death. Before we come to the table, before we come to the table of the Lord's Supper, before we come to the table in our families, I'm going to leave you with five ideas. Number one, minimize, I'm sorry, maximize self-examination. 1 Corinthians 11, 28, and 29, Paul says, let a person do what? Examine himself. And let them eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Examine yourself. Before you come to your family meal, examine, is there conflict in the family that I'm responsible for? Is there an attitude? Is there an anger? Is there a frustration that I'm responsible for? Could I be part of the reason why our coming together is for the worse and not the better? And of course, this really applies to the Lord's Supper as we think about the body that we commune with today. We also need to maximize thankfulness. In verse 24, it says, when he had given thanks. So there was this sense of gratitude when Christ instituted the Lord's Supper. And there should be a sense of gratitude when we come together with our families and our home, but also a sense of gratitude when we come together as a church. Amen. We should be grateful for what God has given us. He's given us one another. He's given us family, a physical family, a spiritual family. Maximize gratitude. And there are three things we should minimize. Minimize fragmentation. So the early church, they were fragmented. They were isolated. There were divisions. And so we need to work on ways and opportunities to come together. As a church family, as a home family, we need to turn towards one another, not away. We also need to minimize contempt and criticism. Now, here's something really interesting about contempt. Contempt on the receiver, the person who receives the contempt, who is belittled, thought low of, degraded, humiliated, it actually compromises the immune system. And it makes that person more susceptible to the cold, to flus, and to cancer. How serious is that? And the third minimi minimization is to minimize self-centeredness. The early church met with one another and they did not consider one another. They did not consider the needs of their brother and sister. As we go back to our homes, as we have family meals together, are you considerate of the people in your household? How do you show your consideration towards them? Are their needs being met? Emotional, physical, interpersonal. In a moment, we're going to sing the song of invitation, and then we're going to have an opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience. And let us share the body and the